First, let's start with the title. You can understand City's celebrations there, but is it a foregone conclusion? Some would ask. It's not over until it's over. I remember in May 2022, I was in the Anfield press box and news was coming through that Man City were 2-0 down against Aston Villa with 15 minutes to go. Of course, they managed to turn it around and get away with it that day, but Liverpool weren't far away from stealing it from them on the last day. Of course, the Aguero moment in 2012. They don't always do it easily on the final day, Man City. And of course, what version of West Ham are they going to be up against? Because we've seen West Ham win at Arsenal this season, they've drawn against Liverpool, we've also seen them concede five goals against Crystal Palace and Chelsea. Obviously David Moyes' final game. Will they be playing with freedom or will they maybe just be overwhelmed by a City team just completely up for this and clinching the title? So yeah, until that final whistle blows, it's not quite done, but it's what we've been talking about for months, isn't it? Charge in the second half of the season, putting themselves in pole position once again, yeah, absolutely. It feels like it's going to be difficult for it not to be City just because of that record against West Ham as well. They're unbeaten in their last 16 games against them, a run that stretches back to September 2015, a time when David Cameron was Prime Minister of the UK. That was the same month Wayne Rooney became England's all-time top goalscorer, overtaking Bobby Charlton. It was a long time ago is my point. But then you look at Arsenal versus Everton as well, they've got an exceptional record against them at home, they haven't lost to them since 2010, so it feels like both those games could be done. But on the basis of last night, there will be more twists and turns. I mean, very few people gave Spurs a chance given their recent form, you know City's recent form being imperious in that as well. They'd won their previous seven games going to last night, they'd scored four or more goals in six of those games, and yet there was that nervy moment, yet that was that save which we'll come on to in due course, so I agree with Nolan. There could be another twist, but City definitely have the advantage. Yeah, because a draw if Arsenal were to win, because a goal difference wouldn't be enough. It has to be a victory. James, all season though, we've been checking that Opta Predictor, their supercomputer, which has been working 24 hours, 7 days a week. Is it starting to take a rest now, a little breather? What was it saying last night? Not quite. Percentages have gone up and down throughout the campaign, but we can see the final predictor ahead of the final weekend of the season. Last night's victory for Man City was huge, and that's backed up by the fact their title chances went from 59% pre-match to 84% now. Now, Arsenal's victory at Old Trafford have moved their chance of winning the title up to 41%, the highest it's been this season. But Spurs failing to do them a favour last night means they have just a 16% chance of glory on Sunday. And it's worth a reminder Opta's predictions at the start of the season. The supercomputer simulated the season 10,000 times to see how the campaign may play out. Man City won in 90.2% of the simulations, Arsenal in just 4.1%, so Arsenal have a much better chance of winning the title heading into the final game week of the season than they did in pre-season, so there's something to cling on to. Yeah. And the bookmakers make both of them favourites to win, both of them odds on, but Arsenal 6-1 on, Manchester City 1-0-1 on. So it looks like, well, if you believe that, fourth Premier League title in a row, potentially on the cards then. I'm thinking about the biggest achievement by a side in Premier League history because of longevity or just something like Leicester eclipse even four in a row. How do you see it? Yeah, I think Leicester may be up there. Arsenal invincibles, of course, let's not forget them. But four in a row is pretty special, isn't it? In terms of what the players have done, in terms of a sporting achievement, certainly, of course, there's always that little asterisk at the moment with Man City, isn't there? With 115 charges and the foundations of what they've created, that obviously being investigated at the moment. But in terms of what the players have to deliver, to deliver that consistency year in, year out, that really is very impressive from them. The other thing I guess you could talk about is the quality of their rivals, maybe. Man United won three in a row when Rooney and Ronaldo were really at their pump, and that felt like a really special era, an impressive era to win those titles back to back. Chelsea, Arsenal, Man United in 2003, 2004, that sort of real golden period as well for the Premier League. So that's a debate that's going to run and run. But I think in terms of Man City and those players, what they've done couldn't do much more. And I think this is really putting them in a historic achievement in Premier League history and those players will have their place whenever we talk about the great Premier League teams. Yeah, deservedly so, deservedly so. Deserve in terms of a single achievement, I still prefer Leicester. I mean, everyone loves an underdog story. Man City is just not an underdog story, but they still, as Pete says, deserve respect for what they've achieved. They've also in this period become the second English side to win a treble, could become the first English side to ever win a back-to-back -back double, which people are kind of forgetting about as well if they beat Man United, as many people expect them to. It's been an unprecedented period of success, and that's why I just don't put any shame on Liverpool or Arsenal if they don't get over the line this year. 
It's been the case of the best manager in Premier League history, with a collection of some of the best players in Premier League history, and for the early part of his reign at least, very strong spending at least. And even in the last few years, they've managed to bring down that net spend through selling high-quality players they brought in previously, so it's just incredibly difficult for anyone to top them and who would bet against them backing it up next year as well. And part of that is, you know, you need to be thoughtless basically to beat this team now. They've set the bar where you need to basically get 90 points in a season to win the title, which you know, those previous teams I spoke about, the points totals were a little bit lower, but you almost have to be perfect to beat this Man City team. Yeah, I mean, Man United only got over 90 points three times under Sir Alex Ferguson. If City win on Sunday, that'd be the fourth time in the last seven years. So it's just, it's never been done before. And okay, Haaland's goal's obviously key, but the man next to him, Kevin De Bruyne, another assist for him, Nolan, that moves him up the list for most assists in the Premier League, doesn't it? Yeah, it's a trademark move from the Belgian midfielder who's led to Haaland's opener last night. How many times have we seen that? And his assist, which moves him past Cesc Fabregas onto 112 in the Premier League. Now, only four other players have 100 Premier League assists or more, and none of these others here reach 100 faster than Kevin De Bruyne. He's still 50 behind Ryan Giggs' all-time record of 162. That tally does seem a long way off. De Bruyne has one year left on his contract. You'd think he'd probably need a couple more seasons on top of that to catch gigs, but either way, he's in elite company.